research interest in medical ethics and in particular neuroethics. So remember that I'm this is part of my overall effort to promote uh, discussions in neuroethics here in Taipei. Uh, she uh, is interested in digital ethics, philosophy of mind, philosophy of identity, and genealogy. So many, you know, a lot of overlap with my own interests and potentially yours. Hope so. Uh, and she's currently uh, working on a postdoctoral project at the World Hero Center. Uh, on issues relating to a narrative identity and how it's influenced by uh, the self-knowledge that we can gather from novel and emerging technologies, including neuroimaging and digital technologies such as, such as health and location trackers. So Muriel has published already a number of articles on this topic of, of identity and she's going to talk to us about this Today, so I'm looking forward to our talk, which is titled uh, How Personal Information Technology Impacts Identity. So, Muriel, welcome to the seminar. Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for, for having me and for giving me the opportunity to talk in your seminar. And I'm very curious already to hear your, your thoughts about my research. Um, one second. If I this this is this is move my slides now just to be. Oh. No, I'm not changing. Um. More technical I'm sorry. Um. <laughs> I will just share them again. Um. Yeah, we've run into that problem before where sometimes the first slide gets stuck and I think one thing that people did was like they had to share their whole screen, if I remember correctly, and then they could change the slide. So. Um, let's try quickly. Is this working now? Yeah, yes. it is. Oh, great, great. Yeah, I'm not very used to the Google Teams, so I have to <laughs> just a bit. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. So, um, what I want to talk about today is yeah, how personal information technology impacts identity. And the idea of this research was that um, in the ethical debate so far, there's mostly a focus on what happens is if personal information um, gets into the wrong hands. So, what if other people exploit this information or manipulate someone with this information? And I want to look at what happens if it gets into your hands. So how does it impact you? How does it change you if you have um, this technologically generated personal information? And this is um, the outline of what I want to talk about now. So first, I will briefly introduce this personal information technology. So what kind of technologies are out there? Um, what kind of information can be gathered? Um, and then because I think that the impact of this uh, personal information technology on identity through a uh, narrative conception of identity, I will briefly introduce narrative identity um, to then turn to this overall question, how PI technology, this personal information technology impacts narrative identity and there I want to look at four points. The first is that I provide um, content, an extra check on the um, narrative identity. It may alter um, significant characteristics. Um, it impacts the relational dimensions of narrative identity. And then I want to mention something about the extended self briefly before I conclude. And with Personal information technology, I want to look at five different types of technology. So these are autobiographical information, health and activity trackers, neural information, digital profiling, and genetic testing. So an already very common and widespread kind of personal information provided by technology is autobiographical information. Um, so we have, um, especially through cell phones and other um, types of 
handheld devices, we have much more accessible um, uh, opportunities to record, store and share autobiographical information, notably our social interactions through call logs, text messages, emails, um, our physical and online presence through, for example, location trackers or browser histories, um, and but then also specific situations and events through photographs or videos, or a more extreme version of this is live vlogging, where someone can um, wear a camera and either just record videos of their whole day, their whole lives, or a camera that just takes a picture every minute um, throughout the day. So there are a lot of um, much more accessible ways to record and store your life um, through modern technology. And compared to how we usually store autobiographical information in our memories, um, this information does not decline over time, or at least not to any degree comparable to our memory. And it can have nearly any degree of detail and comprehensiveness. Another very widespread type of information technology are health and activity trackers. These can be applications on, for instance, smartphones, or it can be standalone devices, such as um, smart watches or um, there's an aura finger ring or smart clothing and they can measure a vast range of metrics um, about our bodies so for instance heart rate sleep cycles body temperature blood oxygen level or they can be used to track menstruation or physical activity um, there's also apps that where you can register how much you drink or how much you smoke or your um, blood insulin level for people with diabetics and those technology do not just like give you information on like where you stand um, but they are often combined with prompts or nudges towards healthier behavior user actions we have uh, neuro information um, so neuro information is typically gathered to some form of brain imaging this can be an, an MRI, PET scan, EEG, uh, they are different methods. And in the last, last decade, those methods have become more powerful by um, combining them with uh, machine learning. So the, there, we can gather more information from this neuroimaging data by applying uh, machine learning technologies. And they can provide information about currently and likely future disorders, about social attitudes, personality, impulse control, humor, lie detection, stress levels, emotional states, and more. There's a vast range of information to be gathered from um, different forms of neuroimaging. Um, and there's also an expanding use beyond the healthcare context. So for instance, being used in your marketing, in dating services, uh, or through direct-to-consumer neurotechnologies. These are neurotechnological devices or applications um, that can be bought by the consumer themselves outside of a clinical or research setting. Um, and they typically use uh, wearable EEG um, that uh, can record, for instance, your stress levels while you wear it throughout the day or your emotional state. Um, and then I want to mention um, digital profiling. So by this, I mean just all the inferences that can be drawn from your online behavior, from what you buy or listen to online or the websites you, you visit, um, all, those, all those different kinds of traces we leave. Um, and there's, again, a vast array of, of characterizations that can be drawn from this, um, such as your spoken languages, age, political opinions, preferences in food, clothes or entertainment, um, and even whether one is likely to have insomnia or depression. And of course, especially companies that offer services across uh, a broad range can um, create a quite a specific image of their of their customers, for instance, Google with Google Maps and Gmail and Google Search and Google Meet, as uh, we're here today. Um, so there, there are lots of opportunities to draw uh, personal information from, from this type of online behavior. Um, and finally, I want to mention genetic testing. So 
genetic testing has been around for a while. It can be used to diagnose or rule out genetic disorders or predict the risk of some, for some future conditions. Um, they're often used to determine biological relatives, so who's the father of someone. And more recently, um, because those uh, kinds of tests have, been, have become much more accessible, much cheaper, um, they've also been used in a more, let's say, like for, for more recreational, like fun application. So um, to determine ancestry in a broader, um, in a broader way, so to say. So this is this um, 23andMe things where people can determine whether they're, for instance, 15% um, Croatian or 20% South African. This is mostly uh, popular in the US American context, but it's also gaining popularity in Europe, for instance. So having seen that, we can say that PI technology can make claims about substantial characteristics of people, about their personality, about their interests and values. Um, and they can provide um, information through which you can gain substantial self-knowledge upon reflection. So someone might scroll through the text messages and realize that they're actually not as helpful as they thought they were, because every time they were asked to help someone, they refused. Um, so they can do both, like give direct substantial input, but also give input that um, that uh, you may realize upon reflection. Um, then PI technology can also provide large amounts of trivial information, um, kind of like chunk information, and it can provide inaccurate or biased information. Um, and finally, it can also be hard to understand. So sometimes it might be difficult to understand what this um, neurotechnology means for you. What does it mean if this um, brain imaging shows me that I'm um, introverted or that I'm stressed at this moment. And the last like overall uh, comment on, on PI technology is that, so the way I've presented it now, I'm aware that this is not a very homogeneous group, but I think it still makes sense to discuss PI technology together because um, PI technology provides an external perspective that is quantified, measured, and allegedly objective and objectifying. So it paints this picture of you, this external perspective um, that has some, um, that shares some um, properties even across those different technologies, insofar as it is this external and quantified measured objective perspective. And this technological external perspective stands in tension with a first personal narrative self-understanding and with a relational external perspective on you that other people provide. So you have your the way the perspective on yourself generated by yourself, then you have the generate the perspective on yourself generated by other people. How do other people see me? How do they describe me? How do they react to me? And then we have this technology that provides a third type of perspective on ourselves. Um, and now I want to look at um, narrative identity briefly um, to then look at this interaction. So according to narrative self-constitution view, the self is constituted through a self-narrative. And a self-narrative is um, basically your life story, your, the, the trajectory of uh, your life. Um, narrated from a first personal perspective from your um, from your personal view that reflects um, your experience and your personal opinions and so on um, and in this like narrative self-constitution view this constitutes the self um, we can also understand narrative identity a bit weaker um, then narrative identity is just part of a pattern theory of self so the self consists of more um, then just the self-narrative, even without the narrative, you might have a self. Um, but this is just to give some background on narrative identity, as the argument of this talk does not depend on this question, but just to um, yeah, sort it in a bit in this debate. 
Um, so the idea of narrative identity is, again, that humans integrate their experiences into an internalized and evolving story. And this self-narrative is a story which is telling one's life events from a personal perspective, which is reflecting character traits, goals, and values. And this is um, an active, ongoing process of self-interpretation and self-definition. So, for instance, a person may have thought in her youth that coming from the Basque region is central to who she is, and then later in life she considered this as accidental. So, through the course of your life, you may um, reevaluate your your um, past self narratives and, and reinterpret them as you go on. So it's this ongoing, going, dynamic process. Um, and then we explicitly narrate some parts of the self-narrative. Um, so this is um, the clearest example is when someone asks you why you're doing something or um, for, for example, if I'd ask you like, why are you in this seminar? You might think that you're always interested in this topic or you're just here because you want some credits for a certain course, for a certain degree. Um, so we narrate, we give answers to these questions in terms of narratives um, and in making our narrative explicit to others and to ourselves um, we also settle certain things about ourselves we make decisions about who we are and why we do things and we reflect on who we are and why we do things we make ourselves intelligible um, and we also in in this more explicit notion of narratives we also um, edit narratives you make them um, we, we select what is important about ourselves we disregard what we think is is uh, irrelevant um, we abridge things we find patterns we connect small uh, actions to overarching goals and intentions and so on and other parts of the self-narrative uh, they remain implicit so this is kind of the idea that um, even even things you have never consciously thought about in your life or even the older parts that you have thought about at some point but you're not actively thinking about right now they remain somehow like at the back of your head somehow it's 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 still there so for instance a person that's um been rich their whole life when this person walks through a store they have a very different experience compared to someone who has been poor their whole life even though they're of course not walking through a store thinking i'm rich i'm rich um they still have this awareness of where they're standing where they're coming from and their projection into the future um is still as a as a background awareness somehow um present for them and in this sense the self-narrative provides a distinct phenomenological perspective so you experience the world through this um through this uh, grid of the self-narrative and um, through this diachronic perspective so this temporally extended perspective where you see yourself as being on a trajectory through life um, we make ourselves intelligible so again like we narrate our our actions and so we explain why we're doing what we're doing we connect overarching um, intentions um, to to more specific actions and so on um, we ascribe meaning to events and actions and and emotions by connecting them to other um, life goals and plans and actions and so on um, and we plan and lead a life so by understanding um, by understanding yourself as being on this trajectory through life as on this narrative path you understand yourself as being um, part of a life that you have to somehow manage and that you have to lead. And finally, um, to be able to engage in social and forensic practices, which are concerned with, with responsibility and accountability, you have to adhere to reality and art articulation constraints. So this is the idea that um, to, for instance, for someone to be um, held accountable in the sense that we would blame them or, or praise them if they're doing something good or that we would sign a binding contract with them or enter into long-term commitments in another way um, we need some sort of shared common ground 
So the reality constraint says that the self-narrative should fundamentally cohere with the shared understanding of reality. Um, so with someone who thinks that he's Napoleon, you probably wouldn't sign a binding contract or you wouldn't hold him accountable if he um, doesn't hold on to a promise um, because he has to um, lead France into a battle. You would understand that there's you have such a different understanding of reality that there's no common ground that we would really hold them responsible or accountable. And the same goes for the, for the articulation constraint, which says that you should be able to articulate self-narrative, at least partially. Um, so if you want to hold someone accountable, they also have to be able to give an account. If I ask you why you're here and you can give no answer at all, you have no idea what you're doing in this, in this seminar, that would be worrisome. Um, and we might wonder um, whether we have this kind of shared common ground we can build on. So now I want to look at how PI technology impacts this um, narrative identity. Um, and I want to look at these four different points. I mentioned them already, content and check, significant characteristics, relations, and the extended self. And I first want to talk about them kind of descriptively. What's the relation between this, um, this PI technology perspective and narrative identity with regard to those four points, and then also for each of those raise some ethical issues that I see arising. So first, I think um, this is fairly intuitive that PI technology can provide content for the self-narratives. So they can provide us with information which we may integrate into this first personal narrative perspective. And here, um, I think we can distinguish between three forms of content PI technology can provide. The first one is data. So these are kind of data points which are, in terms of one's identity, largely uninterpreted. Um, for instance, uh, your body temperature, location tracking, a daily step count, or a certain neuronal state. And of course, they are not coming without any framework of meaning or interpretation, but they to be meaningful and, and um, uh, intelligible for you as um, in terms of your personal identity, you have to integrate it into your self-narrative. So for instance, um, a 39 degree body temperature measurement of a health tracking device might be displayed in red and then it thereby offers an image interpretation of a warning. Um, but to understand what this data means for the individual, we must know whether this is a toothing toddler or an adult who was meaning to attend, attend his friend's wedding or a minimum wage worker who cannot afford to stay at home. So this is kind of data points which have to integrate, be integrated into this um, overall narrative to, um, to gain uh, personal meaning and to yeah, become part of, of a person's identity. And then secondly, it can provide um, patterns. So PI technology can find and define patterns within this data, which can serve as interpretative tools to reevaluate past and present elements of the narrative, as well as future pro projections. So this could be preferences identified through digital profiling or behavioral patterns derived from new information. Um, so, for instance, if a brain scan identifies that you suffer from a mental disorder, you can use this pattern, this behavioral pattern that comes with uh, mental disorders, to reinterpret the past, present, and the, your projection into the future um, of your self narrative. So, it can give you this um, scheme and interpretive tool um, by identifying certain patterns. And finally, um, PI technology can provide narrative pieces and templates. So this is information that comes already with a narrative structure. Um, so there's already this diachronical, temporally extended element. And this allows kind of for a more direct input into the self-narrative. So this can be certain text messages. Uh, for, for instance, if someone is texting, um, I'm breaking up with you then this is not just a 
a point like a data point, but this comes with a certain temporal extension into what happened in the past and what will happen in the future. Um, then, for instance, health trackers, which are setting certain goals, also have a certain temporal extension. So they don't just measure where you're standing now, but compare this point to some um, ideal state where you could get to, and often also suggest ways how to get there, how to train or how to sleep better. Um, so there's a certain temporal extension which allows you to have certain projections into the future, um, which are part of, of your self-narrative, of your narrative projection. Um, and then we have these um, narrative templates, which can be um, something like a master narrative, this more general, culturally shared um, style and narrative pieces, narrative um, um, structures and forms. Um, a very common one is the redemption narrative. So this is um, a narrative of someone facing some obstacle and then overcoming this obstacle. And by having overcome this, this, this hurdle, um, they end up being stronger and, and having some, had some, some uh, yeah, more strength, more insight. And this is, for instance, used in the Smoke Free app. They um, encourage the user to imagine themselves in the future as a non-smoker um, and to imagine like how good their lives will be as a non-smoker. And they promise the users that after having gone through this, they will have increased mental strength. So they project a redemption narrative into the future for the users that should make it easier to overcome smoking. So by already being set on this redemption narrative path, you're more likely to actually go through it and um, stop smoking. Um, so by integrating this content into the self-narrative, in the best case, um, it may become richer, it may become more detailed, and it may become less self-deluded. Um, so this is, yeah, if the information is correct, you may have some insights about yourself that you were um, maybe mistaken about, or you can just become um, more extensive for your self-narrative. And then secondly, this external and allegedly objective perspective through PI technology can broaden the application of the reality constraint. So the idea of this point is that if more aspects of who you are are measured in and kind of fixed in ways which we agree to be real reliable, then your identity becomes more fixed. There are more checks on, on who you are. And for instance, as aspects about myself, which I have not been aware of, can be brought to my attention through PI technology. And to follow the reality constraint, I would have to acknowledge them. Um, or I might uh, come to realize that I've been self-deluded in, in some ways. Um, and in some cases, I would have to um, acknowledge this if I would want to, um, if I would want to uh, violate the reality constraint. And in this way, PI technology can increase the, the pressure for revision. And to look at this in a little bit more detail, so if the provided content of this uh, technology is in tension with your self-narrative, you have two options. Um, the first option is you can just adjust the self-narrative. So if I read the text messages and I see, oh my God, I've, I'm not actually a helpful person, then I might just have this insight and come to revise my self-narrative. The second option is that um, I might reject the provided information as unreliable. And depending on the technology, this can be fairly easy or this can be more difficult. So, for instance, um, the categorization by Google has fairly large margins of error. Um, so we know that they get many things wrong. So if Google tells me, oh, you like hiking, um, but I think I don't like hiking, then I'm not just going to be like, silly me, um, I must like hiking. Um, but instead, I'm going to say, yeah, Google got that wrong. Um, 
because we have this fairly large margins of error with Google and we also be usually pretty good at telling what we like and what we don't like. Um, in such a case, it's fairly easy to reject this provided information. But if you want to say um, that this, okay, this text that changed with my friends, they, they're not true. They don't reflect what our um, conversation really went. Then you have more difficulty in rejecting this, um, unless you have a really good story why why this this texting service is is altering your your conversation, um, you will probably fail the reality constraint. So in this sense, there are more checks on the self narrative by having this external measured perspective on ourselves. And now to some like of the ethical issues that may arise um, with this. So if the provided information is wrong, it can, of course, lead us to a less sustainable self-narrative, a narrative that is less helpful in successfully navigating the world, and it can lead to more self-delusions. Then um, the information can be hard to assess because it is intransparent or requires expertise. So with intransparency, I mean that, uh, of course, a lot of these applications and devices and so on, um, they do not give you access to the specifics of how they generate this information about you. This is company property. They will not share their algorithms with you. Um, but even if they would, it's extremely hard to understand how this information is generated. So if this EEG measurement measures my stress level, um, it's really hard to understand how EEG measures brain signals and how this translates to, to stress um, responses, for instance. And this means that the value of the information is hard to grasp. So it's hard to understand um, which information to trust or in which situations you can trust this technology um, and what to do with that information, really. And lastly, I want to mention that um, this imposing of more checks on the self-narrative can in some sense limit creative self-definition. So we can understand this narrative constitution of self as a creative process within the boundaries of gross factual accuracy. And if we make those boundaries more narrow by imposing more checks, there will be less room for creative self-definition um, and people may be feel that their personalities are more like calcified. It can be um, feel like more like stuck in a certain personality and less room for creative outbreaks. Then next, I want to address the um, possibility that PI technology may alter what we consider as significant characteristics of a person. So narrative identity construction is not just about collecting information about yourself, but it involves interpretation, evaluation, and organization of information. It involves finding patterns, connecting actions to overarching goals or dispositions, labeling oneself, and more. And this process is guided by socially shared and often disputed concepts. And I think PI technology is involved in this process um, of, of um, labeling, characterizing, inter interpreting, and so on. So to go in a bit more detail, so of course not all your values, emotions, abilities, or aptitudes are centrally defining you as a person. So feeling slightly scared of heights or the ability to touch your toes is probably not what really makes you you in an in a important, interesting way. And, and this goes back to, to Charles Taylor's work. You cannot choose individually what is meaningfully self-defining. Um, so, for instance, you cannot just say that being able to touch my toes is defining me as a person. Um, because if we could just choose it individually, then anything could be meaningful and we would end up with somehow with uh, universal triviality. And instead, what is uh, considered as substantially defining characteristics depends on shared horizons of meaning, how Charles Taylor course calls them. Um, so what is meaningful is negotiated in this socio-cultural and political space. 
So for example, having blue eyes and blonde hair as traits of an alleged Aryan race had very specific meaning in uh, Nazi Germany. So uh, society constructs shared horizons of meaning among others through such categories and identity labels, such as being Aryan, being black, being an incel, being liberal, and they are imbued with meaning and come with practical consequences, as is uh, evident in the case of um, uh, Nazi Germany and the Aryan race. And now let's move back to um, PI technology. So here I just want to mention um, some examples of categories used by PI technology to describe people. So Google profiling um, for their um, advertisements, they put people into different brackets and different, um, assign them different characteristics. Uh, one would be a thrill seeker or family focused, a woman's media fan, a luxury shopper, an SUV enthusiast, married, male, female, recently graduated or a large employer. With neural data, you may be identified as an extrovert, as a stroke survivor, or as a schizophrenic. Um, with genetic testing, someone can be identified as a BRCA gene carrier, which comes with extremely high risk for developing cancer, as a father, or as someone um, with Croatian or Central African heritage. And health trackers can identify different body types, for instance. So these are just examples of this process of organizing, categorizing, and labeling. Um, and another example, which some of you may have come across recently, um, is the Spotify yearly recap. It tells people that they are, for instance, among the 2% of childish Gambino listeners or something like that. Um, so these um, PI technologies create or recreate categories and define how to measure them. They identify people and ascribe it to them. And by doing so, PI technology can influence which characteristics are considered as meaningfully defining a person and how the meaningful personal characteristics are defined and measured. So PI technology can offer and define new categories to identify with. They can identify patterns in our behavior or in our body we might have been aware of, and thereby they may slightly alter how such categories are defined and the meaning we ascribe to them, especially if they're more widespread. Um, and one example of this is genetic testing of, of heritage. So through the commercial availability of genetic testing, um, it has become, people have become much more aware of their heritage and started to ascribe more meaning to it. So suddenly being 12% Croatian is an important part of who they are. And moreover, genetic testing became a novel standard to identify what, for instance, being Irish or being Italian means. So genetic heritage matters over cultural heritage um, because we have this um, technology available. Um, and another example would be how it provides, uh, how neuro um, data provides new measurements for, for mental disorders or, or emotional states. And particularly mental disorders are increasingly biologically defined and diagnosed. And now to some um, ethical issues uh, of this changing of significant characteristics. So first of all, um, it might make distributive justice issues more pressing. So this is the idea that only individuals with access to this technology get to define themselves in relation to the personal information it provides and to the um, potentially fulfilling dimensions of meaning and significance. Um, then such identity labels can be harmful, bigoted, they can promote stereotypes or be missing. So if Google categorizes you as female because you engage in typically female hobbies, this might provoke, promote um, problematic stereotypes. Um, or for instance, in genetic testing, you have much more um, specific and diverse information for people with European heritage than people from other parts of the world. For instance, uh, it, it may differentiate whether someone is from Croatia or Albania 
but only say whether you are from a central or southern African background. So in this way, certain identity labels can just be missing. Um, and then identity labels are not just defined and ascribed, but perpetuated. So most uh, this is most clearly in the case of um, targeted advertisement. So if Google identifies you as a SUV enthusiast, they will go on showing you ads for SUVs and other content. And then you are more likely to um, become an SUV enthusiast to actually like this. Um, so it can become a more significant characteristics of yours, which is driven by commercial interests um, and not necessarily by your identity interests, what would be most uh, meaningful or fulfilling for you. And companies are already exploiting such identity effects to bind users to their products, as I said, most obviously in the case of targeted advertisements. But also, for instance, Spotify is binding customers by making them feel special about their unique music tastes, which they can listen to on their platform. OK, and now I want to turn to the relational dimensions um, of the narrative self, which may be impacted by PI technologies. So narrative self-constitution is deeply embedded in a social and cultural context. Um, so we are not narrating um, in isolation, but others are, first of all, necessary to develop narrative capacities. So we need others to learn languages, and we also need others to... Um, toddlers are being encouraged to narrate, so we, we learn to... to have to, to do these uh, to develop these narrative forms early early on in our development and of course they also fundamentally shape and influence the narrative content and form so we learn to know ourselves through interacting with and comparing ourselves to others others constrain what kinds of narratives we can adopt we define ourselves through our relations to others and others define labels narrative threats and templates and suggest which ones are appropriate so there's a wide range of ways how others impact our self-narratives um, and help us um, create them. And PI technology, by providing this second external perspective on us, can on the one hand impact this relational um, um, interaction we have going on with other people, and they can take this role for themselves. So PI technology can influence, can easily influence relational dimensions because the information is easily shareable and narratable. So in contrast to introspection, there is no first person of privileged access to this information, but you have the same access as I do to this external perspective. And it is more easy narratable because you can refer to these specific um, labels and measurements and data points that is created by this. Um, technology and um, then PI technology can support or undermine positions in these relational negotiations of identities. Uh, one example of this was the um, it was called Central Park bird watching incident where um, a black man was accused of um, attacking a white woman but he was filming the whole incident. She was also calling the police. And because he had this, he could draw on this um, video, on this um, information provided by this PI technology on what occurred um, in this dialogue of who he is and what he did, PI technology could support his narrative. He could support his um, position in this negotiation and could support it not just um, towards the police, but also in the wider social context and to his friends and so on. And then PI technology can also take the role of the other. So similar to how we interact with other people's external perspective on us, we can relate and react to the external perspective on ourselves provided by PI technology. So others indirectly shape our self-narrative by showing us through their reactions who we are. And PI technology can also reveal who you are by kind of reacting to your online behavior by showing you relevant ads or other ways of reacting to your behavior in, in health trackers, for instance. 
and then it can explicitly describe you as other people do um, by suggesting labels or patterns or narrative templates and pieces. Um, and also like, like an old friend with whom you might reminisce about the past, PI technology can remind you or vivify episodes of your autobiograph autobiography through pictures or videos or texts and other forms of autobiographical data. And lastly, um, in these relational dimensions, PI technology can lead to a different mode of negotiations and uh, of negotiating disagreements. So usually we negotiate disagreements about identity in terms of um, in terms of interpretational dialogues. So if you think I'm very stressed out at work, I had this outburst, and you think that's a sign of me being very stressed out, we we are on this interpretational level, how to interpret this action, is it a sign of stress or was it just an annoying situation? But if I was wearing one of these um, neuro devices that measures my stress level, we will shift to a mode of negotiating disagreements in terms of facts, in terms of what does this device measure, can we trust this device, how does what it measures relate to what we're talking about. So there's a shift in negotiating disagreements in terms of interpretation to uh, negotiations in terms of, of facts, of measurements and, and um, technological facts. Um, and now again, turning to the ethics. So PI technology should follow ethical norms for co-narration insofar as it um, operates in this room. This means Again, it should avoid damaging or oppressive labels and categories. It should support the assessment of accuracy and interpretation. So we should be informed transparently how accurate this, this um, information is and how we should interpret it. Um, and it should avoid leasing, leading users to question their authorial skills or to question their values. So if uh, Google um, identifies me as female because I like crotcheting, even though I identify as male, I might think, oh, I should have a different hobby. So it might identify users, uh, um, eliminate users from their values, or it may lead them to adopt a self-defeating self-conception. Um, if someone is thinking, oh, this neurodata shows that my addiction is ingrained in my brain, so I must be a helpless addict. So it'd be very self-defeating self-conception. So, um, the ethical upshot of this is that um, should be care PI technologies should um, provide this information with a lot of care and context to avoid um, such negative effects. And now this is just very briefly, I want to mention some things about the extent itself. So Richard Hersmink argues that because um, external information can constitute memory, um, and then this external autobiographical memory can cons can be part and, and be constitutive of the self in a narrative um, conception of the self. And this means technologies such as life logs, for instance, are part of an extended self. <clears throat> and therefore, he goes on to argue, they require uh, special protection. And but I think if we look in more detail at the narrative self constitution view or just narrative identity views, we see that these autobiographical memories only contribute indirectly to self constitution. So the narrative self is constituted by the phenomenological perspective, which allows us um, to see ourselves as these diachronically extended agents, which are living this person meaningful life. Um, and this self-constituting perspective due to its nature of being a perspective is situated in the individual and cannot be extended. So according to this view, the self is not an object that can have more or less extension, but it is a perspective that enables a specific self-understanding agency and engagement with the world. And PI technology provides a different external perspective which can be integrated into the self-narrative, but it is not in itself part of the self. Um, but PI technology can shape, stabilize, stabilize or evoke the narrative perspective. So particularly technology 
which is recording and storing autobiographical information, can stabilize the self-narrative by providing autobiographical memories which do not change or fade. And it can invoke particular narrative threats and let you experience the present in the light, as well as shape your more general ideas of who you are. Um, and it can, for instance, uh, allow a person with severe dementia to at least, dementia, to at least temporarily understand herself as on her personally, uh, personal temporarily extended trajectory through life and to ascribe meaning to the present situation in light of this bigger unity of her life. So it can have um, various important impacts on our ability to create a narrative perspective and it can as I argued, shape this narrative perspective substantially, but it is not part of this narrative perspective because it is an own individual uh, perspective on its own. And as to the ethics, this means that in cases where PI technology greatly supports the construction of a self-narrative, I would still argue that it still warrants special protection from interference. So I would still support the um, ethical conclusion here's link draws. And now just to very briefly conclude, so PI technology provides this external, actually ob objective measured perspective on ourselves, which can greatly influence narrative identity construction in many ways in through our relations, to providing content and checks or by changing what we deem significant uh, characteristics of a person. And thus, we should ensure that PI technology not only serves commercial interests, but our identity interest through accurate, transparent, inclusive, and accessible personal information. And yeah, that was it for me. I'm looking forward to your comments or questions. And if you have more comments or questions after this session, please reach out to me. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>